Welcome to Axian Labs and Axian Training Institute. My name is Lee Polite, and today we're going to talk about changing your GC carrier gas from helium to hydrogen. In fact, we're not just going to talk about it, we're going to do it on a real GC. So we're going to fire up this GC, we're going to do a run with helium, I will show you how to make the switch, and then we're going to switch over to hydrogen. You know, I've been teaching GC and HPLC for more than 30 years. Happy to have uh, taught more than 12,000 professionals in the field. And one of the common questions in cut that comes up, especially uh, recently, is what do I do if I have to change from helium to hydrogen? Um, and to most of us, it seems like a, 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 a really large topic, maybe a difficult uh, challenge, but the reality is it's really simple stuff. So um, first question is, why do we care about switching from helium to hydrogen? Uh, and the reason is, well, helium is a non-renewable resource. We have a limited amount on this planet, uh, and whatever we had, we made 30 million years ago, and Mother Earth uh, uh, took, I think, uh, nickel during the uh, radioactive decay and created all the helium we're ever going to have. And that helium is stored in the, uh, sort of in the belly of the Earth in, in, in pockets, and when we're mining for natural gas, we find pockets of, of helium. So the weird thing about helium is it's one of the only uh, compounds on this planet that has an escape velocity, which means if you poke a hole in the ground and there's helium in it, the helium will escape, it'll go up to outer space, it'll never come back. You know, um, if you walk up to a lake and poke a hole in it, water doesn't escape and go out to uh, go up to Mars, it stays here on Earth. So helium is non-renewable. It's a limited resource and we are running out, which means it is getting more expensive. So how do you switch from helium to hydrogen? The reality is it's really simple. When I wrote the very first version of this, published a paper back in uh, 2014, and, uh, uh, and, and after that publication, I got to writing a one hour lecture on it. And the title of the lecture was gonna be how to switch from helium to hydrogen in three simple steps. And when I got to the point to write that slide, what the three steps were, I realized there's really only one step. So let me show you the only thing you need to do, switch from helium to hydrogen. So if you bear with me for a few minutes, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through a little bit about the background, a little bit about um, uh, how the GC works, and then explain to you how simple it is to make the switch because it has really no chemical uh, interaction in the GC uh, separation. So the beautiful thing about GC, we could change the cure gas and not change the separation itself. So let's take a look at my slides and I'm happy to send you a, a copy of these. So let's start off at the very beginning. Uh, life in the fast lane, switching from helium to hydrogen in not three, but one simple step. Um, first, a little bit about my background and, uh, and who I am and, and, and who we are here at Axion. Um, you know, Axion is a uh, training institute uh, in our last 25 or 30 years. We have trained professionals from every single major pharmaceutical, chemical, and petroleum company in the United States. We've also trained all the people from the big laboratories, from the big government labs, the DEA, uh, the DOD, the DOE, the US EPA, um, uh, all the government folks. And uh, what we do is we take people from beginner to expert in one week. And the reality is GC is, uh, is a really simple concept. It is a lot simpler than people think. Um, uh, it just is a bunch of simple things hooked together to make them look complicated. So I like to take people through uh, explaining how GC works in a very simple way by using a lot of analogies. And, and here's one of the analogies that I really like is to think about an automobile. Now, when you're thinking about a car, um, uh, if you really wanted to understand how a car worked, you would have to have a PhD in physics, right? I mean, you'd have to understand adiabatic expansion uh, inside the engine and torque transfer and gear ratios and, and the coefficient of friction between the rubber and the road, um, it would take you years to understand that. Yet, we all know how to drive a car uh, because we know that if we push the pedal on the right, the car goes faster. The pedal on the left, the car goes slower. So GC is the same thing. There's a bunch of buttons and knobs and dials on the instrument, but each one does something. One of those buttons makes the analysis faster. One of them makes the separation better. One of them improves the sensitivity. So once you know what they do, it's just a matter of uh, uh, flipping the right switch. So now let me take you through this concept of chromatography. Um, so we've taught this for many years to thousands of people. We are an alliance training partner with, with Agilent Technologies, uh, and we're also the exclusive provider of hands-on training to the American Chemical Society. So, um, gee, one year ago, 
uh, we were at PitCon 2020. Remember that? That was pre-COVID. Yes. So one weir- year ago, we were there, and here's the uh, Axion crew, and we were actually giving away a car. Yes, you could have been the proud new owner of that uh, Porsche 911 uh, if you had been at PitCon last year, 2020. Uh, so there we are uh, a year ago. Um, here's another picture of the uh, the Axion crew. Uh, one of my favorite pictures because this was taken uh, back in 2014 when we wrote this paper on switching from helium to hydrogen. And uh, this was, uh, we were getting together for, for the picture. And I will admit a couple of those kids in the middle, my two sons, Nicholas and Dennis. And if you look down towards the bottom, you could see that we're not all quite uniform. Uh, Nico sort of uh, forgot to wear the correct color shoes. And those are the bright green fluorescent uh, shoes that ended up following him for the rest of his life because we got on the cover of that magazine. Then this is where we, uh, we published the paper. Okay, so this was a great, it was a great paper. It was uh, probably one of the top received papers at PitCon back in 2014. And what I wanted to do is take it and sort of distill it down to a very easy to understand uh, uh, it, uh, sort of presentation. So let me first start off by talking about um, gas chromatography. This is the world's most popular analytical tool. And uh, the reason for that is it does an excellent job of separating a wide variety of compounds in a lot of different matrices. So on the picture on the left, we see a chromatograph, a modern GC, and the picture on the right is a chromatogram, the output. Now, um, here's an example of a GC chromatogram. This is coffee. So if you ever think about Mother Nature and the complexity of Mother Nature, here's a good example of it. Coffee contains hundreds of different chemicals. Um, how can we possibly separate those or, or analyze them? Well, we could do it by GC. So GC is a very high resolution technique. Um, there's literature out there showing over 400 compounds just in the aroma of coffee. So uh, uh, that just shows you the, the, the power of GC itself. So how does this technique work? Most people like to think of it as a black box. It's some kind of magic. Well, the reality is this is completely understandable. What's happening inside is a separation. So if you peel back all the layers of that really fancy looking instrument there, really it's a separation tool. It separates complex mixtures into pure components. You ask the question, why do we separate? Well, we separate to identify, to quantify, to purify, but step one, we have to separate. So how does separation happen in GC? Well, you can imagine the molecules. We make an injection. We make the injection into a hot injection port and all the molecules vaporize. And then we blow these molecules through a column. So imagine that column uh, in this uh, example uh, shown as a bunch of little particles with a coating. That coating is the stationary phase. And think of it like a thick, viscous uh, liquid, like a motor oil. Um, this thin coating of this viscous liquid allows for interactions to occur. So molecules are cruising through the column. They see the stationary phase. If they like it, they stick around. If they don't like it, they keep moving. So I use an analogy when I teach uh, GC, and that is my analogy of the, uh, the shopping mall. And this analogy, I go to a shopping mall with my sister, and the mall is a very long linear mall, and in the middle there's a moving sidewalk. So you stand on the moving sidewalk, and it transports you through the mall. As soon as you see a store that you like, you get off the moving sidewalk, spend time in the store. So the first store we come up to is a, um, a ladies' dress shop. My sister goes in and spends time. I have no interest in dresses, so I wait on the moving sidewalk. By the time my sister comes out, I'm going to be 100 feet in front of her. So now we're cruising through the mall 100 feet apart. The next store we come up to is an accessory shop. Hats and gloves and purses. My sister goes and spends time. I wait on the moving sidewalk. Now I am 200 feet in front of her. Finally, we come up to a, um, a shoe store. My sister goes in. We call this irreversible adsorption. She goes in and she never comes out. So at the end of the mall, who's going to come off first? Who's going to be standing there looking at her watch waiting? Well. I'm going to come off first because I have very little interest or very low affinity for the stores inside the mall. The same thing happens in GC. You make an injection, all the molecules enter the column at the exact same time. But as they travel through the column, some molecules have a higher affinity than others. They interact more with the stationary phase. They lag behind. So if you could understand that shop mall analogy, you could totally understand GC. So in that analogy, the moving sidewalk is the carrier gas. It's the mobile phase, it's the helium. It has one purpose, and that is to provide transport. All it does is it just pushes things through the column. It doesn't interact, no chemical interaction. This, by the way, is very different than HPLC. Because HPLC, the mobile phase, plays an, an important role in the separation. In GC, the mobile 
phase plays no chemical role, just physically. So that is key for us. That's going to allow us to make the switch from helium to hydrogen and not really worry about how it affects the chromatography. Okay, so uh, modern columns, of course, are no longer packed columns. They're capillaries. They're long, thin, little glass tubes with a thin coating of stationary phase on the inside, but the same concept. We're going to push our molecules through that column. The more they like the stationary phase, the more time they'll spend, the longer they take to come off. Okay, a little bit of theory for you. Uh, yay, GC theory. No one has ever said that. So if you're not saying that, I, I understand it. Okay, I'm not going to take you through any theory. I'm not going to make you look at this equation or do it any kind of uh, calculations. But I do want you to understand a really important concept. And that is in GC, it's all about the separation, right? That's the key to the technology. The separation itself is simple. It's a function of only three things. People will, will think, but what about the column length, diameter, film thickness, stationary phase, carrier gas, flow rates, temperatures? Oh my gosh, there's so many different things to worry about. But only three of them affect the separation. Let me tell you what they are so I can prove to you that by switching from helium to hydrogen, we're not going to really affect any of the chemistry. So take a look at, the, at this equation. By the way, we teach hands-on versions of this course, obviously, um, here in Chicago. And if you uh, come hang out with us for a week, we will spend a good 45 minutes on this slide. And at the end of that slide, this is the aha moment for most people. You will walk away and completely understand HPLC, GC, SFC, uh, capillary electrophoresis, because it all sort of sort of falls out of this, this, this one slide. Okay, let me explain it to you. Resolution is our goal. We must resolve our peaks. We need three things to do that. Capacity, selectivity, efficiency. Those are the three things up top. The first one, capacity. Don't worry your pretty little heads about it right now. We'll come back and we'll talk about that during the class. But for right now, let me just tell you, in GC, the capacity factor, capacity, that little K, is all about the column temperature. So this little K, uh, K should be between 1 and 5. Those are the ideal range. So here's the deal. If your K is less than 1, your GC is too hot. Cool it down. Lower your column temperature. If your K, little K, capacity factor is greater than 5, yeah, you're wasting time. Heat that thing up. Get those peaks off the column. So capacity factor tells us, do we have the right temperature for the separation? It's like the Goldilocks thing, right? Not too cold, not too hot. We need it to be just right. Capacity factor tells us if we have the right temperature. Next term, alpha. That's the selectivity. Selectivity tells us one thing in GC, and that is, do we have the correct stationary phase? Not the amount of stationary phase, just the chemistry. This is the one chemistry term in GC. And it's all about the stationary phase and has nothing to do with the mobile phase, with the carrier gas. So then the third term, efficiency. Efficiency is just a mechanical term. It, it sort of talks about how skinny the peaks are. So the bottom line is the first term, capacity factor, has nothing to do with helium hydrogen. The second term, selectivity, nothing to do with helium hydrogen. Third ter term has a little effect. Um, it'll Generally, it'll be a good effect, but it's, it's a... Uh, purely a mechanical one, and I'll, I'll show you what that means in, in just a minute. So as we come out of this sort of ugly looking equation, we can look at uh, the same concept in a graph. So this is what's called the Van Diemter plot, um, and of course made famous by J.J. Van Diemter. So 1956, uh, Van Diemter, really one of the greatest guys in the world of chromatography, he is the father of chromatographic theory. In 1956, on a homemade GC, he was able to derive all the equations that we use to this day. In fact, he predicted uh, UPLC, uh, Ultra Performance Liquid Chromatography. Um, so this one guy back in 1956 sort of did all this work. Well, actually, he didn't do it by himself. Uh, Van Diemter was part of a team. He worked for a refinery, uh, the Royal Dutch Shell Refinery in Amsterdam. He's a working guy, and he had a team. Um, and uh, uh, we always think of it as the Van Diemter equation. But uh, his second guy in the team, was his name was von Klinkenberg. Um, uh, and the third guy's name was Zauderbach. So uh, the reality is Van Diemter was the only name that was easy enough to pronounce. So I think that's why he's remembered in history. Isn't that sort of a sad, sad statement? So uh, we do remember von Klinkenberg, von Klinkenberg and, and, and Zauderbach as well. So what Van Diemter taught us, just look at this and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and let me explain the, the two axes. On the y-axis, HETP, don't worry about what that means. For right now, let's just say that's the inverse of efficiency. In other words, we want that to be a small number. That's going to give us the skinniest peaks. Think of that sort of like horsepower. We, we want to generate the skinniest peaks. 
that will give us the best separation. So the, the y-axis, we want the number to be as low as possible. Now the x-axis is the flow rate or the linear velocity, how fast the helium is moving through the column. We want that to be as high as possible, right? The faster it is, the faster the analysis. So when you look at these three gases, first, if we just look at that, inside that circle, if you're running linear velocity of 20, 25 centimeters per second, all three of these gases are about the same. Now, and they're not exactly the same, but for the most part, so, you know, uh, without splitting hairs, they're about the same. Give you the same results, give you the same efficiency. Um, but now look as we crank up the flow rate, as we say, hey, I want to do my analysis faster. We'll notice that the hydrogen line, the blue line, is always lower than the rest. So remember, the lower the number, the better. So here's a simple thing that I remember. The optimum flow rate for helium is about 25. Um, so if you're running your analysis at 25 or 30 centimeters per second with helium, that's really common. Uh, what I remember is hydrogen at 60 equals helium at 30, which means if you take your current analysis, switch to hydrogen, double your linear velocity, you will get the exact same results you got with helium, but you're going to do it in half the time. Did I catch your attention there? Yeah, I think I did. Okay, that means you switch to hydrogen and you cut your analysis time in half. Yes, that really works. So let me, uh, again, look at the graph and explain why. If you're running right now at 25, 30 centimeters per second, you can see where the green and the blue lines sort of cross. And now imagine, go from there, double, so go up to 60, see where hydrogen is, the blue line? And that's just about where you were with helium back at 30. So double in your velocity, get the same work done, the same quality of work done, same resolution in half the time. Okay, um, just another pretty plot I would toss in there for you. This shows the different column diameters. It explains why we like small column diameters. Smaller diameter column, thinner films give us that flatter Van Diemter, that ability to go fast and not lose the quality of the, of the analyses. Okay, so um, just a couple of practical things here. This is the typical GC uh, instrumentation plumbing. Um, usually we have three tanks sitting in the lab. We have helium as our carrier gas, hydrogen and air for our uh, FID detectors. Um, now we have some options here and one of the options is to use hydrogen for both hydrogen fuel for the FID and for carrier gas. So here's the, uh, here's what we use in our lab. Um, I'm a big fan of generators, gas generators, hydrogen, zero air, nitrogen generators, uh, just because it makes my life much, much easier. Um, they're small, they're not dangerous. We don't have to store any dangerous high pressure helium uh, hydrogen cylinders. Uh, we just run off the hydrogen generator. So the cool thing is, um, not only are the generators sort of, they make uh, the gases as we need them, uh, but you notice we've also eliminated the purifiers. So I don't use any purifiers anymore in my laboratory. You could, you could search, there's, there's no, uh, no purifiers in the gas lines because um, the hydrogen generator generates seven nines, 99.99999% hydrogen. What's there to filter out? So uh, I'm a big fan of going this approach because it allows us to simplify the plumbing in the lab. Um, here's an example of uh, the hydrogen generator that we're using. Our friends at uh, uh, Parker Hannafin uh, supplied that. Um, and it's, uh, it's great. We just add water to it and it produces really high quality hydrogen. And the cool thing is it's, uh, uh, you just add water. It's um, uh, fairly simple to, very simple to operate. Okay, um, so here's my how to switch from helium to hydrogen in one uh, simple step. Uh, and my sta statement is make the switch. Simply switch the gas from helium to hydrogen. Uh, when you make that switch, tell the GC that you made the switch. A modern GC, uses that information to uh, calculate pressures and flows. So it must know what your carrier gas is. It uses that viscosity to know what pressure to apply in order to get the correct flows. What you'll notice about hydrogen, one of the many advantages is that it has much lower viscosity than helium, which means we, you, we can operate at lower pressures and still get higher linear velocity. So there's some, some neat advantages. Um, here's the deal. If you simply switch, from helium to hydrogen, then, um, and tell the GC you've made the switch, you will get the exact same chromatogram. Exact same as in same retention times, same uh, resolutions, same everything. If you wanna take advantage of that switch, you know, do your homework, do one more step, and that is double your linear velocity. Whatever it is right now, if it's 30 right now, go to 60. If it's 50, go to 100. Double your linear velocity, 
you'll get the same results in half the time. So if you're running isothermal, if you're running constant temperature, then you will exactly cut your analysis time in half by switching to hydrogen, doubling the linear velocity, and the result will be the same separation, the same resolution in half the time. Yeah, so you don't give away anything. We actually gain speed, do not uh, lose resolution. So that really is, uh, I think, the, the, the big takeaway. Um, when to proceed with caution. Okay, this is not a panacea. There are some examples where you do not really want to switch to hydrogen. Let me give you the two examples that come to mind when I, when I always give the advice to, uh, this advice to customers. And that is, if you're doing headspace, be careful. Older headspace instruments would pressurize the vial with the carrier gas. That is the default way of doing things. So you have a, a 20 mil vial, headspace vial, it's filled with air. You now will pressurize it with normal helium. If you're using hydrogen carrier gas, you're not pressurized with hydrogen. You've made an explosive mixture in an enclosed container. We don't like doing that uh, inside laboratories because it could become a pipe bomb and, and, and explode. So um, we want to avoid using hydrogen to pressurize. Most uh, modern Headspace auto samplers, I've got two in my lab, two different generations, and they both have the ability to accept a pressurization gas separate than the carrier gas. So if, you, if you're doing Headspace, still you can do it but you must make sure you're pressurizing with nitrogen or helium, and then that you are uh, using hydrogen as carrier gas. And then the other, other example that I um, say uh, proceed with caution, and that is if you're doing GC mass spec, my simple opinion, leave it alone. GC mass spec, you're on, you're on the cutting edge to begin with. Uh, don't mess with that thing. Um, you could switch to hydrogen. However, if you do, some people have reported um, that the spectra change a little bit. We get different maybe a couple of different masses, different ratios. That worries me because that's how we identify things. Um, and also it seems to have some, some sort of a cleaning effect where you run hydrogen for a while and maybe you see some extra masses, maybe they go away with time. You lose some sensitivity because of the diffusivity of, of hydrogen. So um, you lose a little bit of the goodness of the GC mass spec. You can regain that by changing the lens stack and making some changes inside the mass spec itself. So when I hear all that, I think hopefully your conclusion is the same as mine and that is, Leave the mass spec alone, let it run with helium. We can switch all the rest of the things over uh, to, to hydrogen. So um, uh, here's a couple of examples. This was temperature programming. And what I want to show you here is these were all at 60 centimeters per second. So if you remember that sort of magic uh, curve over there, this is way above the optimum for any of the three gases. And the, the point of this slide is to show that uh, all three gases work for the separation. So don't think that if you are using the wrong gas, you fall off the, the cliff. Um, they work, uh, they all work. If you notice, nitrogen peaks are slightly fatter, right? Slightly wider than the other two. If we, uh, and this again, reminds us why that's, uh, why that's the case. Um, in this example, we have, uh, the top one is with helium, the bottom chromatogram with hydrogen. We're using the exact same linear velocity, which means identical chromatograms. Identical means, identical. So um, you can overlay them, same retention time, same resolutions. If you want to take advantage of hydrogen, double that linear velocity, and now we do the same analysis, the same resolution in half the time. So that really works um, in, in, in real life, even with complex samples. Okay, hydrogen safety. Let's, uh, let's not um, uh, forget to talk about the safety of hydrogen, uh, because this is an important one. Uh, hydrogen is explosive. If you get to 4% in the atmosphere, it becomes an explosive mixture. Uh, the health and safety people frown upon explosions in the laboratory, and, and so do I. So we don't want to get uh, into that type of situation. So a couple of things that I remind people. First of all, modern GCs, they're built to handle hydrogen. Um, the, uh, uh, they have special uh, shutdown procedures when you're using hydrogen carrier gas. If you're using hydrogen carrier gas and, uh, well, let me start with this way. If you're using helium and you uh, have a leak or run out of helium or some, for whatever reason, you can't reach pressure, we all know that annoying beep that we get, you know, every 30 seconds, beep, hey, don't forget me, beep. And so that's what it does with helium. If you're using hydrogen and you have a leak or you cannot reach pressure, you get this uh, really scary sounding, uh, sounds like a, a, like a, a European police car. You know what that sounds like, right? Yeah, so it's a sort of a scary sound and it shuts down right away and it shuts down all the channels. It immediately, in fact, I have um, uh, uh, here listed someplace where what the GC actually does is it actually shuts down the flow to all the channels 
uh, and it shuts off uh, the flame right away, and it shuts off all the heated uh, zones. So it shuts off all the heaters, so there's no source for um, for ignition. The other thing I remind people is we're already using hydrogen, right? Let's let's face it. We, if you have an FID, you're running 30 or 40 mils a minute of hydrogen. So uh, this would use another couple of mils a minute of hydrogen through your through your column. Okay. Um, so do be careful with hydrogen. Uh, uh, our biggest concern would be a column breaking inside inside the oven. Fortunately, the way I look at it is, uh, if if a column breaks, usually up close to the inlet, the pressure drop is so severe that the GC notices that and, and will generally shut down. Okay, uh, what happens during the safety shutdown? Uh, yeah, here's the slide that I promised you. Uh, the offending channel, I like the way they put it. The offending channel um, and any associated channels are shut down. Uh, all the split valves are open. We want to get rid of any trapped hydrogen that's in there, nothing pressurized. The oven, the fans, all the electronic zones are turned off, and the alarm, the, uh, the uh, European police car alarm uh, uh, goes off. Okay, um, and when you have that uh, problem, you can't simply just you know press a button. You have to shut off the GC and, and turn it back on to, 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 to resolve that. Okay, so thank you for listening to this stuff. But now, more importantly, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, what I'm going to do is I got my GC, which has been patiently idling here in the background. So right now, I have it set up with helium. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and tell it to start, so we can uh, start an injection. And uh, so you probably hopefully see this camera. This uh, um, I just want to make so they can see this. So, just in case you're bored there and want to see some real chromatography, so here we're going to make a uh, very small injection. I think it's a 0.2 microliter injection of um, of a hydrocarbon mix. It is uh, three hydrocarbons, C14, 15, and 16 in hexane. So again, this is helium. We'll have a typical chromatogram um, in here in, in just a moment. Uh, I believe the Time is about one minute. So if you're looking at my screen, um, here's where we're going to tell it the switch from helium to hydrogen, the inlet. Right now I'm using helium. Um, my column over here is running 32 centimeters per second. I'm a big fan of using linear velocity. Once you get the Van Diemen stuff, this is the way to go. We know that, you know, 30 is about optimum. Uh, you know, anything lower than that is wasting time. Anything above that is making things faster. So here we've got some peaks coming off. We've got uh, a beautiful chromatogram. The second peak is done. I've got one more peak. So once we get this third peak, what I'm going to do is um, I'll stop the run and we'll get on the printout, we'll be able to see the, of course, the retention times in the areas, but we'll also see the resolutions. I, I use the, uh, uh, here we're using uh, ChemStation. Agile chem station, and I use uh, the performance report, which will automatically calculate, uh, I think, the most important variables in GC, the capacity, selectivity, efficiency. So here's our chromatogram with helium. We get a beautiful separation of our three peaks. The last one comes off right at a minute. Um, and over here, we have a resolution of 7.76. Um, that's the goodness of the separation, right? We want that to be at least uh, one and a half. So helium works great, about a one minute uh, chromatogram. So now, we're gonna make the switch to hydrogen. In fact, I will make my, uh, my chief chemist do it. All right, guys, welcome around to the back of the GC. My name is Dennis. I'm uh, a helping hand here around Axion Labs, and I also happen to be uh, Dr. Polite's son. Uh, I hope you'll forgive the slightly unorthodox setup we've got going on here. We've put a four-way splitter between our two inlets, and on the other two sides, we have an option of what to feed it with, um, one of them being helium, and the other one being hydrogen. Uh, right now, we have it running on helium, you can see through the yellow, yellow switch. I may even zoom in a little bit for you guys. So we're gonna go ahead and do the first step of switching from uh, helium over to hydrogen. Gonna go ahead and turn the helium off. Wait a few seconds, make sure there's no back pressure. Hydrogen on. Uh, this isn't what hopefully you'll have set up in your lab. Maybe it'll be a little bit more sophisticated, but by and large, that's all you gotta do to the back side of the instrument to switch it over. We're going to go back around the front and show you guys the last step. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, and let me remind you that the only reason we have such a complicated plumbing behind our instrument is because uh, we use our 13 GCs for training classes. And um, we've rigged them so we can run them on helium or hydrogen. Actually, we do a lab 
where we do a whole method development in helium, then we switch to hydrogen and make it faster. So um, uh, that's why ours is a little more complicated than, than what you would normally see. So now that Dennis has made the switch physically to hydrogen, we need to tell the GC that it's running hydrogen. Remember, the GC needs to know that so it can set the correct pressures to get the correct flows. So two places to do it, we could do it on the front of the instrument. So if I go over here to, uh, we could do this on a 6890, 7890, 8890, uh, whatever the GC is. Um, you know, a Shimatsu GC, a, 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 you have a, a, a trace um, from thermal, um, all work the same way. In this case, I'm gonna say config. Uh, I'll scroll down to where it says front inlet, hit enter. Right now it's configured for helium, I'd go in and change it to hydrogen. Uh, but let me also show you how to change it in the software. So on the screen, um, same sort of concept, we're gonna go to the inlet. Uh, we're gonna go to where it says gas, we're gonna drop down and we're gonna say hydrogen. So notice what's gonna happen as soon as we uh, notice the pressure, something's gonna change there. I'm gonna switch to hydrogen. Uh, I'll hit apply, and now, um, once I've done that, you see pressure is starting to change, and more importantly, if you come over here, columns, we're gonna need to make sure our linear velocity is set back down to 32. Pick that up from the pressure change. Okay, so we're gonna run the exact same linear velocity we had before. Uh, we've told it that right now we are using hydrogen instead of helium. Um, here's my little trick. Uh, gas saver is the greatest thing ever. I love gas saver. For right now, I'm going to turn it off and it gives us a really high split ratio, like a 200 to 1. Remind me to change that back to 50 later on. The reason I do that is because now it's going to blow a bunch of uh, hydrogen through, through the uh, system. What I want to do is essentially get rid of that um, uh, last bit of helium that, that's in there. So it only takes really a few seconds to, to, for that to happen, uh, but we usually should wait a couple of minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to take on a quick tour of the lab, the Agilent equipment and um, uh, the rest of the laboratory. Uh, the cool thing is, this is where we do all of our training courses. We're downtown Chicago in what's called the West Loop, sort of a fun neighborhood, lots of restaurants and bars that you could walk to from here. Um, we're in this 120 year old building, uh, it's a beautiful old place, and we have eight HPLCs and 13 GCs set up just for our training courses for you guys to come here and take them apart, put them back together, and figure out how they work. So we have a bunch of stations sort of like this with an LCGC sitting next to a, a, a one another. Uh, that allows us to teach uh, LC and GC at the same time or in separate classes. And then if we sort of walk around, um, again, another LCGC, slightly different models here and there. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter what make or model you have of a GC or an LC because you gotta set the parameters the same way. So over here, we have one lone uh, FTIR, yes, Got to have some spectroscopy in here, right? So another LC and GC stack over there. Um, wandering through, you saw Dennis in here earlier. Here's our one of our GC mass specs. Another GC, another GC, of course, uh, LC. Another LC GC stack. A couple more, a couple more. We have a couple of interesting detectors. This one has an arc detector on it. Um, very neat for looking at things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, formic acid. It's a way to sort of um, uh, beef up their sensitivity in the detector. Um, here we have our gas system. So here's our hydrogen generator. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as our, as our house plant because we have a house plant on top of it. It just sort of reminds us to water it. We typically water it once a week. Uh, to me, the real trick with hydrogen generators Turn them on, leave them on forever. Don't ever shut them off and feed them really clean water. I think it's minimum uh, one mega ohm. We always use 18.2 mega ohm, HPLC uh, grade water. Uh, keeps it happy forever. We've had these things running for you know a decade without uh, any, any, any service. Um, we also get a lot of great use out of our zero air generator. Uh, this guy takes compressed air and takes everything out of it. So now we uh, are just about tankless. Um, because the hydrogen generator produces all the hydrogen. Uh, there's our air. Nitrogen generator, we don't use as much, but we're doing some um, experiments actually coming up, uh, looking at swapping out makeup gas, using nitrogen for makeup gas. So you'll see a Headspace uh, a GC set up over here, another GC mess back, back there behind Dennis, and then back around to our uh, more our LC GC stacks. So at this point, um, I'm assuming that the GC has had enough time to swap out the helium for hydrogen. 
So I'm going to go up here and tell our um, our inlet. Remember, I bet our split ratio 201. I'll take it back down to 50, uh, like it was before. So remember, our linear velocity is the exact same it was before. Oops, 32 centimeters per second. Um, so I expect to get the exact same uh, chromatography, uh, same retention times, and same everything. Um, so let's go ahead and here and change our name because we are now running hydrogen. And we'll start our run. So um, we gave it a little bit of time. What was that? Maybe two minutes to flush out. Probably not, uh, maybe not quite enough, um, but we should be able to tell here in just a second how everything, uh, how everything looks. So remember, when you're running a GC, the carrier gas, the mobile phase um, in GC plays no role in the separation. Uh, its only job is to provide transport, to push things through the column. So we need the, the carrier gas to be inert, uh, and that's really all we need. So we could switch from helium to hydrogen and not affect that selectivity term, not affect the chemistry at all, um, keeping the same linear velocity, which means we're going to keep the same retention time. So we could do this in such a way as to really not affect the chromatography at all, but switch, make that switch from helium to hydrogen. So here we have our... Um, first peak, our T0, uh, our solvent front, which has come off. And here we see our couple of peaks. Our first peak is off. And our second. It's the fun part of chromatography is the weighting, correct? Okay, and our last peak should be coming off right around a minute. And there we are at right around a minute. So, um, Keep in mind, we just sort of made that switch and gave it uh, a, a short little time to sweep out. Uh, but it looks like the separation is pretty similar. If we look at the chromatography, beautiful peaks. Uh, last peak comes off at uh, right around one minute, um, same as last time. And our resolution has actually gone up a little bit. I think before we were 7.76, now we're 8.33. So, uh, so what's happening here is we are getting the same retention times. Um, we are getting essentially the same resolution, slightly better because of that slightly skinnier peak. So if we simply switch from helium to hydrogen, tell the GC made the switch, we're done. It works great. Now let's take advantage of that hydrogen. Let's take advantage of that flat Van Diemter. So now I'm going to go in here and I'm, I'm going to say, hey, instead of 32, give me a 64 centimeters per second. Uh, so now it's going to double the linear velocity. It's going to do that by doubling the pressure. It's going to go, <laughs> look at that, the beautiful thing about hydrogen. We're running 64 centimeters per second. And it only takes 7 PSI to do that. So um, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and we'll remind ourselves that this is 64. Uh, OK. So the neat thing about doubling the flow rate is guess what's going to happen to the analysis time? You're right. It's going to get cut in half exactly. So that one minute run should be done in 30 seconds. Um, I stuck my neck out there. So let's see if this theory really works. So our uh, initial peak should be coming off a lot faster than it was before. Um, and then all of our other peaks should be coming off in half the time. So my one minute analysis could be done in 30 seconds. Um, could it be done faster? I don't know. You guys tell me. What would you do to make it faster? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you could increase the linear velocity yet again. Why stop at 64? We could go up from there. So here we're getting our three beautiful peaks. Better sensitivity. Um, that has to do with the uh, split ratio, higher column flow, blah, blah. But um, beautiful uh, peaks. And now um, our separation is done in, like I said, in half a minute. So let me go ahead and stop it. So remember before we had our three peaks off in a minute, we had a resolution of somewhere around eight, right? Uh, 7.76 on the helium and somewhere you know, a little over eight for hydrogen. So now we are operating uh, twice as fast, right? Half the time. And our resolution is 8.55. What? It went up. Okay, so 
We are loving that Van Diemter curve. I know it sounded like theoretical stuff, but what it gives us is faster analyses that are still good. No loss of quality. In fact, a slight improvement in the quality. Okay, so um, dare we be bold enough to go uh, one step further? Sure, why not? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, 128? I tried to keep the math simple. So can we do it? Um, yeah, we need 14 PSI to do that. Uh, how much pressure does the GC have to work with? You got about 100 PSI. Most GCs go up to 100. I don't really like running them up near 100. <laughs> um, that's where you'll find all your leaks. Typically, we're running more around you know, 10 or 20 PSI. But again, the beauty here running hydrogen is that we can run at extremely high linear velocities, uh, 128 centimeters per second, and still operate, still be using reasonable pressures uh, on the inlet. 28. And let's see what this one looks like. So anyone want to predict? The uh, analysis time, the last peak will come off. Yeah, it should be half the time before. So the last one was 0.51, so whatever that is. So about 0 0.25, 0 0.26 should be our last peak. Um, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, I don't wanna push the math too far, but uh, uh, it, it should work out. So now we're taking a one minute run, as if that wasn't fast enough, and we are cutting it down to uh, 15 seconds. Yep, we are done. Our analysis was done in uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.26, 0 0.27 minutes. So yes, 15, 17 seconds, we are done with our analysis. So think about if your analysis was originally 10 minutes, we would have cut it down to uh, three minutes. Um, yeah, pretty cool, right. Okay, so hopefully you learned a little something today about switching from helium to hydrogen. Remember to check with your health and safety folks. Uh, make sure it's okay to be using hydrogen. Uh, you wanna be uh, especially careful for looking out for leaks and that kind of stuff. But from a scientific perspective, the switch is easy. From a chemical perspective uh, within the GC, uh, helium and hydrogen don't make a difference to, to, to the instrument. So you can make the switch, cut your analysis time in half, and save the planet and save some money at the same time. So if, if you want to learn more about that kind of stuff, come visit us here at Axion. We teach our boot camp class, LCGC boot camp in five days. You learn both LC and GC, guaranteed to be an expert in both. Uh, you'll develop methods, you'll do troubleshooting, you'll take apart the instruments. Uh, it's really a, really a fun week. So come join us. And if you have questions, send us questions, info at axionlabs.com or come visit us at the website. Thanks.